Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about Gnostic Warfare. We have Patrick Ryan joining us on the show. Howdy, howdy. Thank you so much for coming on, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Super is this mic excited. On? Yeah. Is it on? Is the receiver on over here? It's all good. We can just restart the stream. Why, 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 why? Let's just. We didn't do an audio check? Didn't do a level check. Uh, nope, it wasn't on. Uh, whose fault is that? My fault. Mic check. We can do Let's level. Let's do the show. Sit just down. do it. Fuck it. What does it matter? Just sit end down. it. Sit just, down. Just Whatever. End sit down. It's sit authentic. Down. Start the show. It's authentic. Ron, end the, end the stream, uh, please. Why? <laughs> Ron, just run with no, it. No, just do it. Just do it in post. Victim no, <laughs> Ron, end the stream. I don't want to. I don't want to do it twice. Just end it. End then the stream. Do the show. <laughs> I quit. I'm completely okay. If, if we have to leave, <laughs> do the show. The content we'll cover is dead on. I don't get why you won't. Did you guys it. shake hands yet? I certainly did. Okay. Now do your intro. Ready? You're on. All right. For those that don't know Patrick Ryan's background, he has a history training the chance to attack AI. You can find the links in the bio below, cultstate.com, as well as his Twitter profile. All right, let's jump into things with what are your thoughts on the direction of our world? We're in the, us as a species, we're in the last moment in time where when AI makes a mistake, it's funny. Because after this, it's bad. You're going to have a lot of AI neural networks. I'm not even approaching AGI quite yet, uh, artificial general intelligence. That's, that's another conversation. I'm talking about the good enough neural networks that exist today where they can make their correlations, they can figure out the patterns, and that's enough to fulfill an investor or a business criteria or a profit motive. Those, that ecosystem of neural networks is accumulating at a rapid rate. And when we tip over to relying on those correlations, the automation of those correlations especially, when they make mistakes, it's no longer funny. It's going to be devastating when they make mistakes. Um, so we are at the very tip of this period of the ironic shit posting, AI loving, worship kind of thing, and then, oh my God, these things are in control of policy. Um, so when the likes of Elon Musk is running around fearful of AI, He's probably not talking about it from a policy standpoint. He's talking about it from the big mythical monster who's going to do whatever it wants because it's AGI and we can't possibly fathom its intelligence. I'm here to give the opposite message. We can beat AI. We can take it down. We can dismantle it. We can systematically put it into chains. We can disrupt it. Anything you can imagine, anything that needs to be done to put AI in its place, not just AI ethics bias crap, that's garbage. I'm talking about attacking its actual infrastructure, getting the results that need to be done. That's my specialty, that's what I focus on. So I'm trying to get ready for that tip where it stops being funny and it starts being serious. So just in case, if we misprogram the first versions of a general intelligence that we need to have our ways of fixing that error. You're going to need insurance fallbacks for sure. And I always tell people, if you don't have to wait around for artificial general intelligence. If you want that, have a kid. I mean, you're already there. The neural networks in their current form are probably no more smarter than a five-year-old for certain domains, not even across general spaces. They're no smarter than a bee in most cases. So uh, AGI, in my humble opinion, uh, is still a long ways off. Um, and that's because of the evolution of the neuron itself, which we will get into. Um, but the insurance policies I'm talking about is when the good enough neural networks, the sort of crap versions of AGI, start dominating the economic space and the financial space. That's the big one. So when the policy making, the economic space is completely driven by general intelligences. Yeah, that's and, a different beast entirely. And multiple general intelligence is not just a single one. That's oh, yes. some multi-agent com competitions, that type of thing. That's right. Who's in ownership? Who's earning the profits? These types of questions. Who is it serving? That's right. And I know we're kind of in the crypto space. They're talking DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations, as a hedge against that. It's not a hedge. It's just a channel. It's, it's no different than uh, placing a put. Um, it's just a different channel for investment. So I'm 
I'm specifically speaking of when these type of pre-AGI, soon to be AGI sort of methodologies start dominating the policy making space, the economic shaping space, and the financial decision making space, and eventually the insurance space, which they will, they're working on. Um, you are going to have policy that is no longer legible by human beings. Imagine, yeah. imagine the, uh, 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 right now, legal firms are looking into using AI to find precedents. So e-discovery, for example, where an AI is mining through hundreds of years of text to find a justification for a case. Perhaps uh, a case is a, a murder situation, and they find a precedence involving a very specific thing from the 1700s, and they use that and build their entire case on that. A human doesn't have the resources to mine through that much precedence, but AI, it's nothing. It's just a corpus review. That's it. So eventually, you're going to have a case where you're going to have a situation in law just to paint the picture of how weird this may become. Um, you will have your lawyers be AI. You may have your judges be AI, and at some point, the argument's going to be made to make the jury AI. So what does democracy mean then? What peers? So it's, it's, it's going to go from silly to serious at some point. They're ideally, from the perspective of the stakeholders and owners of these AI outfits, uh, it is a seamless transition, but it's not going to be. Yeah, from <clears throat> silly to serious. <clears throat> That's what it seems like in most circles, that it's, the discussion is still silly, 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 <coughs> and not yet serious because a lot of us can't <coughs> ab abstract um, a trajectory of civilization and a trajectory of um, going from the shitty games of Pong that we had to the photorealistic uh, massive multiplayer online role-playing games that currently right. exist, so, which is basically what we're in right now. Yeah. 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 So when we learn how to um, abstract uh, the trajectory of civilization and see an evolution like this, and we really kind of like immerse ourselves in that more and more often, we see the transition into a very serious general intelligence as we see it, the, the capacity to run so many different permutations creatively as well as for uh, absorption of evidence in, in court, all these types of things, that our monkey minds become a joke compared to that. Yeah, well, they become a joke. I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that's a, uh, that's a common, commonly held hope that we can transcend our... Our, our evolutionary chains, and we can somehow become this ideal platonic human. Um, I often find that the inspiration towards that goal is more beneficial than actually reaching the goal. Um, I guess that's another conversation. More importantly, uh, that sort of monkey mind, evolution is a messy thing. Four billion years, on this planet at least, uh, two billion years for the neuron to get to where it's at. Our, our brains stand on the shoulders of all of those previous neural evolutionary ideas um, and, and concepts and winner takes all sort of uh, methodology. Um, the evolution of the neuron is a still difficult thing to examine. It's not like fossils of the brain exist. You can't just go digging through mud and rock to see brain engraved somewhere and hopefully you can make a cast out of it. It's much more difficult. It's a lot of genomics. You have to mine through the history of these sorts of things. And fortunately, uh, we are starting to make some meaningful breakthroughs in this sort of research. There's one outfit in particular that I'm working with. It's um, uh, UCSD. They have found a way, uh, Professor Mutri, Allison Mutri, um, he had found a way to take Neanderthal DNA, put it into a human stem cell, and then grow that into a Neanderthal brain organoid. So Jurassic Park, but for, ne but for Neanderthal brains. Um, this was done exclusively to research the possibilities of, of autism um, uh, diagnoses or cures or along those lines. Um, but the possibilities are now endless because now we're, we're no longer 
guessing the evolution of the brain, we can actually experiment with it. And we, we are the 23rd hominid, by the way. We have 22 cousins before us over the span of a million years. But we can pick anywhere along the lines, or we can pick all of them and literally map the evolution of the neuron and start to figure out, oh, this is why, or perhaps not why, but this was the trajectory of why the neuron did what it did. How did it organize? Where did Broca's area come from? Uh, where did our where did our specialization for socialization come from? These sorts of things can are no longer the realm of academic argument. They are going to become testable theories and, mm. and workable experiments, and mm. that's going to profoundly change yeah. the development of AGI. I'm, I'm not going to hold out hope. God bless their souls. Uh, the, the autists in control of the mathematics behind uh, uh, the silicon development, the the specialized neural network uh, hardware. Uh, the techniques that are coming out, uh, convolution networks, I mean, all, all the variations, belief, uh, deep belief stuff, all the variations and methodologies that exist, bless their hearts for trying this game, but they're not going to be able to recreate the human brain, a, 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 a two billion year engine. Uh, they're not going to be able to do it in 17, 20, 30 years, probably not even 400 years. Mm -hmm. It's a monumental task mm -hmm. to recreate what the brain does. Uh, and, and many will disagree with me because they, there is a long-held belief that if we just map the connectome, mm -hmm. every single mm -hmm. neuron that exists, then perhaps we can recreate it. Well, that's not true. If I was to take all of your limbs, disconnect you from them, and put them back together to you, do you think you have full motor function? There's a lot mm -hmm. of missing data. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of missing implication that has to be uh, addressed. Um, simply having the parts of the car doesn't necessarily mean that the car will drive. Mm -hmm. So... Um, a two billion year process trying to be done in 30 years is a it's joke. Yeah. It's ambitious. Yeah. At best. At best. Yeah. Yeah. So then, <clears throat> so then when we get to the point of being able to finally piece together a brain that also is in an environment absorbing inputs and we're able to map exactly what's happening in the physiology on a moment to moment basis, then we're getting closer and closer. We still don't know, you know, felt experience, how to put that into perspective. Stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, so then, now why is the neuron and consciousness such an important uh, aspect of the general intelligence? Neurons are magic. And I don't, I try to embrace as much science, scientific methodology in a lot of my approaches as I can. Uh, but there are, there are some times when you just have to back up and say, <laughs> it's just magic going on here. So take the, the very beginning of the, of the neuron. Let's, 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 I'll give you a parallel and I'll explain why the parallel is dumb and I'll explain how this applies to the neuron. Take um, data science tasks right now where we are trying to evaluate the feasibility of a correlation. So for example, let's say we're mining Facebook data. We want to find out uh, how people vote. We want to hack an election or whatever. So now what I need to do is I need to bring on a bunch of cognitive assets online, a bunch of GPUs, ASICs, or CPUs, or cloud servers, or whatever. I need to expand these horizontally for all of my input. Facebook has a tremendous amount of uh, data lakes. I mean, data lakes, but data oceans at this point of, of everything that's available. Um, I now have to go through that ocean and find the information that I'm specifically looking for. So now I need to spin up a huge amount of cognitive assets to make sense of it. Uh, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes in the process. But what I don't realize is the structural mistake that I'm making. I'm, I have to spin up more cognitive resources to find my answer. It's almost like Zeno's paradox. I have to travel half the distance to travel full the distance, but to travel half, I have to travel half, but I have to travel half. The more cognitive resources I spin up online, I'm not necessarily getting clarity. I have to bounce around between different uh, uh, statistical methodologies or different types of neural networks, or I have to be mindful of regression, or I have to be aware of the vanishing gradient. I have to be concerned of all of these different techniques just to get the answer that I'm looking for. And more often than not, adding more resources doesn't necessarily get you what you need. It can, it can give you the, the details of a specific domain, but it's not gonna give you the grand answer. You still have to very carefully shape what it is you're looking for within that data ocean. You have to imply a sort of bias in your question. Say, I need to look for these conditions, and I need to look for these conditions, and these conditions. So the, the, the nature of your question is actually forming 
the description of your answer. The answer isn't waiting in the pool for you to find. The question is directing you towards the answer. And that can be a bit of a, a, a weird thing. That's a back and forth kind of thing. It's almost like talking to an oracle to a degree. Like if I, if I tell the oracle my secret passions and everything else and the oracle tells me my future, did, did she tell me the future or did she just read my behavior? It's the same thing with the data ocean. Well, it turns out evolution may have experienced this exact problem and it's all embedded in the neuron. So all of our cells are going through mitosis at all times. Our skin is doing it seven times a second or so, or it's, uh, once every seven seconds or something like that. I probably screwed that number up, I'm sorry. Um, but all of our cells by default go through some degree of mitosis, except the neuron. The neuron does not. Now that, given everything I've said about scaling out cognitive resources to solve challenging problems, that sounds like we got stiffed in the deal. Wouldn't it be great if we can just hit a switch and then go through mitosis and now we have more neurons to solve a problem? That sounds like godhood almost. And yet evolution has made that impossible. By default, it's forbidden. The, the, the nucleus of a, of a neuron is completely functional. It just can't go through mitosis. They have neuroblasts and they have the actual neurotube at the beginning and the development of, of the human brain. Um, and so there is a reproductive strategy um, reproduction, repro not reproductive, but to create more neuron strategy. Uh, it does exist in nature, but it's not as, as free will as just go through mitosis on a, on a regular cycle. Uh, neurons cannot go through mitosis like that, and that is for our own protection. See, while we can go ahead and consume all of the material world and turn it into better transistors so we can then use it for our data science needs, um, biology doesn't have that freedom it evolved a very different way. And so as a result, our data science approach to AI does not reflect what our neurology has gone down. So as a result, from the very jump, we have bifurcated. And so we, we aren't gonna to get to AGI by going down this road by doubling down on it and throwing more investment dollars at it. You have to start standing on the shoulders of evolution itself, because uh, it, it did all the hard work for us. And what does that mean? What is the hard work? Well, the neuron, has to consume energy to live. It needs oxygen. 25% of the oxygen you breathe goes to your brain. Uh, the glucose you consume. If your brain went through mitosis and you had double the brain in your skull, assuming your skull didn't explode, uh, you would then consume 50% of the oxygen that you breathe in, and now you start experiencing organ failure. So at some point, neurons may have just gone through mitosis. Chances are they probably all died, and the only neuron that survived was that which didn't. So now you're playing a different game. You're playing a data compression game. Instead of trying to expand, instead of trying to go through mitosis for every photon that's hitting your eye, which is a bad idea, and yet that's what we data scientist types want to do. We want to expand and get all the data as much as we can. Biology said that's a bad idea. I don't need all the data. I just need a subsection of it, and that's enough to solve my problems. Uh, these lights, for example, they generate a light, oh, not these lights, but a light can generate, assuming 1,000 watts, uh, sorry, 60 watts will generate 5.2 times 10 to the 26 photons a second. Your eyes receive 400 million photons a second. That's a huge disconnection of numbers, right? So you're, if you looked at a light bulb, you see 0.0000004% of that light bulb. And yet, it's kind of pretty. The filament's glowing, and the glass is going, and the ambient lighting is reflecting all over the place. It's not even 1% of reality you're looking at. This became, <clears throat> this became very specialized over time. That's right. For very specific things, food, mating, yes. that type of stuff. That's exactly correct. Not to see the atoms that are in the air right now, and That's right. to see those photons, all of them. Um, we're not all over the electromagnetic spectrum. We're in a very small band of visible light. Tiny band. Yeah, and so that's part of this bifurcation of biological evolution with the silicon evolution. That's right. And that's why, in many ways, silicon isn't constrained to two billion year evolutionary periods. That's right. That's right. Because it, there's a, the silicon is, a, is derivative of the industrial revolution, the chemical revolution which was made possible by the Industrial Revolution. So we're looking at silicon as this like primitive cognitive asset. We're treating it as such, financially at least. 
Um, but in terms of the uh, uh, comparatively speaking against a neuron, it's nowhere close. It's nowhere even remotely similar. It's, it's best to treat it as a cognitive asset of a different caliber. The same way I would look at a scooter or a car, I would deploy both depending upon the context. So trying to merge them together, I think, is a bit premature, and it's always sexy to put in a pitch. Um, but when the AI bubble pops, and it will pop, um, people will start to realize that perhaps the silicon isn't all that it's hyped up to be. And maybe even right before we get there, I want to ask you about that, but just the idea of all of the sci-fi where the creatures from other places have just larger heads. Right, right. So it's yeah. interesting to think about the augmentation of our biology to be able to fit something the, that has the same maybe neuronal density as our own brain that is 10 times the size of it that could potentially take in other aspects of electromagnetic spectrum or just balance out like 8 billion worldviews at the same time, sure. you know, things like that. Because if, if, our struct, if we were, you know, 20 foot creatures with massive brains, that type of thing, that then maybe we could somehow more rival a general intelligence in terms of computational capacity. Sure, and that's a, that's a common trope in sci-fi. Uh, we're experiencing right now. We're experiencing that problem right now. Right now with the Neanderthal brains, so they can they can be grown to about maybe that big right now. After that, they require a lot of maintenance. Uh, the nutrition bath can't have any contaminants in it. Uh, there's serious problems in that regard, which can be overcome. Um, the the biggest problem of all is vascularization, mm -hmm. um, getting blood veins to move through the brain. It, Obviously, the blood-brain barrier being what it is, the, the, the neurons aren't taking the oxygen directly. There is a filtration system. But it turns out that the veins are taking heat out of the brain. The veins do act as thermal pipes. Um, and if you don't have that thermal piping, uh, the brain will start to collapse. So to get the veins, you need blood flow. For blood flow, you need a, bar for a barrier. For a barrier, you need a, you need a heart to pump it. For the heart, you need... Uh, a liver for the filtration, and now you need lungs, and all of a sudden you need a whole body just for the brain. The body is the minimal viable product for a brain. And that's a, we didn't know that until you started growing the brains. Um, and so there are problems with just simply growing a brain naively. Uh, for example, there's one technique, uh, Siamese twinning, conjoined, uh, induced conjoinment is what I call it, where if it was feasible to CRISPR a certain part of a uh, certain part of an embryo in vitro or otherwise, uh, what you would do is you'd Siamese twin the brain. So you would actually just that part of the body and you would have a higher density, but unfortunately upon doing so, now your skull gets a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. your neck muscles have to support that, your glucose consumption gets out of whack, you have organ failure because your oxygen's consuming. So this industrial bias where we can just scale because we've been in an industrial civilization for the past, 200 years, um, that sort of scale, up, excuse me, that scale approach, biology doesn't play that game. Biology is the intrinsic exponential technology. It's the very first. Um, and so it plays by a very different set of rules. And what is the AI bubble? Yeah. So Google put $8 billion into robotic firms between 2000 and 12 and 2016, and their final conclusion was that reality is hard. That was our actual words. Reality is hard after $8 billion. That was our summary. Mm -hmm. They're right. Reality is hard. It took 2 billion years to understand reality enough to keep DNA going. Mm -hmm. um, but robots, uh, we, there are still problems when you're dealing with, uh, with video frame analysis where you can't track the object between frames. That proves to be an ongoing issue. Our eyes don't have problems with this. When I, when I look at that pen, I don't see 80% of a pen and 20% of a spaceship. I see a pen. It's either there or it's not. But because of our statistical, fundamental statistical approach with neural networks, it's all statistics the whole way down, which means it's derivative of set theory. So uh, our brain isn't operating in set theory. I know there's, I know, uh, uh, what's his face at, at Facebook is arguing that the brain does back propagation. I mean, this is, this is absurdity. This is complete bonkers thinking. Every civilization since the industrial age has thought that their peak technology is an analog for their brain. The Victorians thought the brain was a giant steam engine or a tiny steam engine. 
So uh, we're playing that dumb game still. Um, uh, and this bubble will pop, not because the technology is bad. It's not that it's bad. It's good enough. It's good enough to deal with financial problems when you're dealing with high frequency trade algorithms or you're trying to do some degree of geopolitical analysis. Um, I've seen some of the AI stuff being pitched to the military. It's not good. I'm not impressed. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of the feedback from the Air Force regarding that. They're basically saying, yeah, another AI product, give us something useful. We're over here trying to sell it as the sexiest thing ever invented, and these generals already bore the tears with it because it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's being oversold and overhyped. The data pools are too big. The, the experience of these tech firms in the space of geopolitics is too narrow. They don't have a firm understanding of all of the complexity and all of the edge cases, and you can't do the agile approach. You can't do iterative things in geopolitics like that. You have the policies they set, the treaties are there, et cetera, et cetera. So you can't take this iterative approach and say, oh, well, a thousand people died because of my policy. Let's change our code. <laughs> it's, it's, politicians lose their job over shit like that. So, so our, our, there's a lot of tension between what's needed versus how we're going about doing it. it sucks. So let's hit on like on a trajectory of civilization we are now at this inflection point like you said at the very beginning and so it seems as though like gnosticism is also coming into some sort of a play um esoteric mystical knowledge what is actually happening on this planet that caused us to somehow is it just chance that from the big bang here we are 13.8 billion years later after four and a half billion of years of evolution on the planet with the specialized neuron like you're talking about. Now we're breaking apart with silicon as well. Is this just all chance? Is there something beyond the 3D reality that is ah, yes. at play here that is, that is mystical or spiritual that is at play here? Sure. So I'll, I'll give two domains of answers. First is I'll focus on the material, then I'll go esoteric. I, out of everything I've seen on the material, I'm, kind of, I'm still iffy on Big Bang. I, I know the problem is trying to address. I look at the numbers, I look at them, mm, I'm kind of iffy about it. The fine tuning problem does not sit well with Big Bang. Uh, fine tuning is where, why is the electron at certain mass? It's a very specific number. If that mass was up or down, any variation whatsoever, the entire universe would not exist. So to get that level of specialization usually implies trial and error, which means more than one Big Bang. It means repeated Big Bangs. Mm -hmm. This is where someone named Lee Smolin comes in. He gets laughed at. I'll get laughed at. Everybody laugh at Lee. Ha, ha, ha. I get it. But he puts a good proposition out there. So it's, it's almost impossible to prove. But it's a fun proposition for its, for its thought experiment value. Um, Mr. Smolin puts out the idea of the fecund universe, where you apply evolution to the generation of universes. So there's a birth, and if the conditions aren't right, it dies. Mm. Whether it dies mm -hmm. fast or it dies slow, who mm -hmm. knows? It propagates, and that in turn generates another universe, so forth and so on indefinitely. This is how you can end up with the fine-tuning number of the weight of the electron. So materially speaking, okay. there is an importance at looking at evolutionary mechanisms in cosmology. There is a value to their whether it's true or not, whether it's provable or not, leads us to our next point, which is the esoteric, and specifically epistemology. Mm. We're starting to hit points where, um, in the higher echelons of, in the higher echelons of academic review, um, we are starting to deal with high energy experiments or tremendous galactic distances, cosmic distances, uh, where we have no way of actually proving any of our postulates at all. Uh, light moves only so fast. There's a specific thing called the Bekenstein bound, for example, uh, where <coughs> a particle can move one direction and a particle can move the literal opposite of it. And if they're at the right velocity, then even if this particle emits light, it will never reach this particle, which means this particle is invisible to this one and vice versa. So it's not a question of exploring the universe. The, the relativistic velocity between the two is so is at, it's at the right number where they are permanently invisible and cannot even influence one another. So is the universe, the observable universe, 
um, there are parts of the universe that we will never ever see, no matter how much our science progresses. So now we have a problem. We know there's a universe beyond there. It's almost like, it's almost like UFOs. We, we're pretty confident there's other extraterrestrial life out there. Uh, but why aren't we poking it? Why isn't it here? Why aren't we touching it? Why aren't we hugging it? it there's, there's questions like that that kind of linger, the Fermi paradox sort of approach. Same thing happens with the Beckham stream boundary. We know there's a universe behind that, that, that veil that can never transmit information to us. We know it's there. We can't confirm it. We can't do a damn thing with it. So now we're talking where science fails, where the scientific methodology in particular fails, where you can't experiment with it. So what does this mean? Well, now we're talking about the failure of the, what I'm going to call the, the progressive reliance of mathematics. And this is going to be controversial, I'm sorry. Um, but the idea that if we just math harder, then we'll get more secrets of nature. If we just, if we do the numbers and we run the equations, then perhaps uh, a, a better understanding of the universe will come to us. And when you look at the sunken cost fallacy of that, that's worked for us. We've sunk in tremendous amounts of resources into building these mathematical humans. Um, it's been going well. This computer's here. Millions of people could potentially watch this. Uh, obviously, we're surrounded. We're drowning in, in the mathematics of our previous success. Um, so for me to say that is a bit heretical. However, when you're dealing with these high energy experiments and these cosmic distances, the problem arises itself in a very naked way. So what does this mean? It means that perhaps ma representing the universe via mathematics is good enough, but there might be another model. I'm starting to suggest that perhaps the basic nature of the universe is actually cryptographic. Okay. So when you're dealing with these problems where you cannot know epistemologically, where belief and, and truth are, are really mess, it's a mess when they overlash, uh, overlap, this is very similar to a cryptographic problem. If you were a code breaker, um, you would be looking at ways to, f uh, there's, there's, two, there's two code methodologies in particular. There's AES uh, and then there's one-time pads. AES was made by NSA. Uh, it is a symmetrical encryption where uh, usually if you do a weighted analysis on a crypto stream, uh, you will find that certain letters are used more often than other letters and that can help you narrow down what words were actually used so you can then decipher the whole thing and poof, there you go, your, your encryption's broken. But with a symmetrical approach, every letter is used equal amounts of times. So all the biasing is gone. So you can't actually figure out what the message was about. So is this like the hard, science harder and math harder is for like if the universe was open source code, but because it's cryptographic code, then we need to also mysticism harder as yes. well as science harder at Precisely. the same time. Precisely, that's exactly it. Because when you're trying to break a cipher, you can math as hard as you want. There's no amount of math you can throw at a cryptographic balance, uh, symmetrical uh, encryption, you can't break it with math. There's no amount of math you can use to break a one-time pad. That's out the window. No, but you could enslave every human being ever to be born, turn them into mathematicians at gunpoint, turn every particle in the universe into transistors to do the math to break a one-time pad, and you still couldn't do it. So now we have a fallacy, we have a limitation, a hard limitation of math. And yet, this limitation of math comes from math. All the cryptographic stuff is a derivative of mathematics. It's interesting that mathematics can actually form a construct that it itself cannot resolve. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting mm -hmm. idea. This is starting to sound a lot more like mysticism. Mm -hmm. So if, the, if we treat the universe as a cryptographic, in its constructs as cryptographic in nature, we can still apply math. You don't have to throw the, everything out. Um, but you will then realize, oh, where these edges exist, we can now start looking at it and approaching it cryptographically. We have to start finding biases. We have to start finding uh, implementation mistakes or uh, weird things like the, the fine-tuning problem. Uh, the electron mass, that's a weird bias. That's probably indicative of some cryptographic pattern. Let's start hacking that. So if you, if you keep a sort of a, a code breaker's mentality when looking at the limitations of where math and nature don't really mesh well together, I think cryptographic can fill in the hole quite well, and that leads immediately to the mysticism. So that, that's how I transition from material to the mysticism. 
is, is, is the cryptographic constructs give you uh, that bridge. Because now you can start applying epistemology uh, to these deeper concerns in a material way, not just the esoteric woo-woo crap, but I mean actual material gains. Okay, and now let's hit on <clears throat> the um, actual training of attacking yeah. the general intelligence. Right. So there's been a period of time where we've started to control and modify human behavior that's become more and more common now. It's probably most prevalent now with all of the algorithms in, embedded in the technology that that sap our attention. Um, <laughs> yes, they do. That w the, most of us still think that we're in control, but we're absolutely not in control. So that's. But this has been a long period of time of of, of modifying, controlling human behavior. Yeah. So, yeah. what specifically were you doing in your journey of training the chance to attack AI? What does it look like to leverage evolutionary biology to hack AI? We'll sure. get into the metadata graphic, the butterfly war too. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I came to Hollywood to learn propaganda. That's why I went there. Uh, the the inspiration for that was. Freaking Scientology, I'm not a Scientologist, but I just saw it from afar. You see all these investments and all these stars and they're all in the Scientology. I'm like, now wait a second, that's not even all that good sci-fi. If people are willing to pay that much for Z-grade opera, how much are they willing to pay for the real thing? That was my reason, that, my, that was my justification, sorry. Came to LA to learn all that stuff and see what were they doing that was working and what were other people doing that was working? How were they bending these photons and these sound waves to get people to change their behavior. That's all, that's all this stuff is. I mean, all this digital tech and media stuff, we're just bending photons and delaying when they get released. That's basically it. Um, but it turns out uh, our evolutionary preference is for the visual cortex for almost a lot of what we do. We've specialized for socialization so heavily. And so as a result, um, being able to read or decode the emotional intention that is within those photons is very, very vital. So if you, uh, well, before I go there, um, I found that people who try to explore this topic, they have a heavy linguistic bias. They tend to think of the human experience exclusively through words. This is interesting to me, because I've never seen it through words. I, I tend to be quite good at words, but, but, but. Versus feeling? Versus social interaction. Versus relationships, social interaction. Relations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So where you have this linguistic bias when examining human history, it's more important to keep in mind that when human history started, there wasn't much in terms of linguistics. Mm -hmm. So that bias is intrinsically wrong. You can't utilize it. You have maybe two, three hundred words tops about 50,000 years ago, and they weren't even full-blown words or grunts or noises, whatever. Symbols. They're symbols. Yeah. Symbols are essential. Um, we'll definitely get to that in a second. Um, symbols were essential. But, but, but those symbols were still powered by something even more prototypical, where if it's you and me, it's, it's 50,000 years ago, we have a loose lexicon, but we're working together because we're part of the same tribe. Our mothers know each other, nature being what it is. We're bound, we rely on each other, and we're relaying useful social information towards one another mm -hmm. about what we intend to do, what's going on, where we've been, who this person is, who that is, and we're doing this exclusively with our bodies. We're doing this with our positions and our postures. You can walk in a room and read a person. Right now, you can walk in a per mm -hmm. room right now, read a person just by the photons that are bouncing off their bodies alone. Just look at that person and be like, hey, he's probably mad or happy or drunk, whatever. Mm -hmm. You can read that on the photons alone. Not a word said, no symbols even in play, mm -hmm. just on the photons. Could you tell I was insane? <laughs> you're you're a mad man. <laughs> the, the, ex the, the extension of your hands and the freezing of your limbs, yes. <laughs> it's alive! <laughs> so the, the, the photons themselves, mm -hmm. packets of light. Uh, they have a polarization, they have an amplitude, they have a frequency, but we're also encoding emotional information on them. Interesting. 
uh, light hits me, bounces off me, the shape and the delay, the frequency, the colors and everything bounce back to you. Mm -hmm. You're now digesting them through your rods and cones, through V2, uh, through V123 all the way up. And now you're extrapolating and pulling out the emotional intentions that are somehow encoded on this photon stream. And this is what your brain is doing, whether you like it or not. We're all doing this. Sorry guys, it's, it's evolution. So we're all doing this. And this is the foundation of communication, before words, before anything else, mm -hmm. before psychology, before sociology, uh, before even religion. Mm -hmm. This is how we were communicating <clears throat> intrinsically. It's just, just reading these photon streams. Um, once I realized that, I started to reconstruct history. Okay, okay, how does this lead to symbols? How does this lead to the preservation of symbols? Why do symbols have the power they have? What's so good about a color and a, and a shape and a, a, uh, a, um, a symmetry? Why is that so alluring? Well, it turns out, no kidding, that's what we're looking for in mates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's really what it boils down to. So, so going back to the example where if you were to expand your neurons to, uh, to take in as much photon data as possible, you would fall over dead. It's more important instead to extrapolate what you need from that photon mm -hmm. stream. And what you need from that <coughs> photon stream is prey, mates, danger. That's the basics. The optimization function. That's right. And those are the basics. You can go from there, but that's the foundation. And all the noise is gone and all the signal is yeah, but is it? That's where things They're get weird. It's not gone. It's it's not processed um, as, yeah. It's 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 not as priority. Yeah. But I I wonder if it's gone. I'm still working on that. I I'm mm -hmm. starting to embrace an idea called cognitive entropy. You'll see this being represented by the likes of Carl Friston. He's doing a lot of work on the Bayesian brain, and he's built an entropic model that relies on dopamine as the heat analog. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing about entropy, and it, it's equilibrium to the layman, uh, but there's, a, there's always one concept of, of entropy that gets lost, and that's the waste heat. You can't, you can't talk entropy if, you, if you're not going to describe the waste heat. So in the, in disorder case, and equilibrium? Uh, uh, the equilibrium between disorder and order, mm -hmm. and how they are influencing and how they, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how they strive for that equilibrium by default. Mm -hmm. But there is a waste heat mechanism. The work goes in the system, um, I'm sorry, the energy goes in the system, the work comes out, and the secondary output is waste. If you want to model the brain as an entropic process, you have to account for the waste. Mm. And that's yeah. where things get dicey. That's where you're, you're mentioning right, right there. Okay, so how, let's lead this then into actually leveraging um, evolutionary right. biology to hack AI. Yeah, yeah. so in this case, uh, looking at this reconstruction of history, seeing cognition and trying to explain its evolution, why it gloms on the certain symbols, why it gloms on the certain behaviors and what it's actually selecting for this entire time, um, I was then able to look at the internet and see it in a very different perspective. So for most people, it's the internet, you Google, you get stuff, you win, everyone's happy. Or uh, you interact with people, you start a flame war, you troll, you ban someone, everyone's not happy. It's, it's one of the two. Um, in this case, I was looking at it sort of like a sociologist's paradise, where people were willingly giving information about themselves without ever knowing they were doing it. It's not a question of filling out a survey. I've been able to find people just by analyzing when they post. You gotta sleep sometime. And so if I take all your posts on Twitter, I can look at your time delay, and I can figure out when you're posting to figure out when you sleep. If I can figure out when you sleep, then I know what your time zone is. If I know what your time zone is, I know where you live. Bang, just on that alone, I figured out where you live. You didn't know you were putting out that information, but I put it together, and, and that's an example. So you can take a lot of secondary examples like that. If I'm getting uh, linguistic analysis, a sentiment analysis, I'm looking at your usage of caps, looking at your usage of punctuation even. Uh, if you're more formal in your typing versus when you're less formal in your typing, that indicates an emotional state. Mm. So you can collect all this sort of information. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that originally with my brain. <laughs> uh, I found out you could do it with uh, neural networks later on, but I was originally doing that with my mind. When I was analyzing the chans, uh, I was looking at 4chan in particular way back when. And uh, 4chan is a special, special place. It's unlike anything that exists in the sociological experiment. Mm. If you look at Tumblr or Facebook, or Instagram, 
Uh, they tend to specialize for certain types of human expression. The Chans are very different because they don't play the social media game. Mm. When the internet first came out, it was mostly everybody was lying about everyone. You had no idea who anyone was. I could change my identity for a post. It was all linguistics. They d it was too expensive for a camera. Uh, what do you, you had to take a picture, you had to get it developed, you had to scan it, you had to put it to several floppy disks, you had to upload it to the BBS, and hopefully other people would get it. That's way too much work. So these, these easy, low-hanging fruit means of forcing identification weren't available to early internet users. All they had were words. So you get different types of social interaction here. You get more honest types of social interaction. And I don't mean honest in the terms of critical exploration. Mm. I mean honest in the terms of humans being animals. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Because there's no way to verify if someone is who they say they are, so there's no way to put social punishment upon them. And that's really that simple. So it, that goes back to It's an not a curated feed of my best self. You could still curate even in an anonymous space. Uh, but the nature of the anonymous space means no social ramifications for social interaction. Yes. Because there's and no way to tie and it. You, we look at the way that we portray ourselves on the current social platforms that are not the chans, and that's it's always the best self. It's the best self, and Instagram in particular. And then the, the chans is, uh, I'll say what I want when I want, when I, yeah. how I feel, yeah. and you will hear it from and, me. And you will hear it. And that's why it seems more primordial, instinctual, animalistic, and less so not curating my best self all the time. Precisely. <coughs> it is human expression in its most honest form that you can possibly collect it, mm -hmm. which is why it was an ideal candidate to review and research. Okay, keep going on that thread. So when you have that, you can actually start exploring emotions. You can start exploring You can explore humans independent of their social bindings. And that's valuable, scientifically at least. Because that will give you that individual at that time in which culture and family raising and moral structure mm -hmm. is significantly minimized. Yeah. It's not entirely gone, but it's significantly minimized. Now even then, there's still a metaculture about the chance, which is interesting. The idea that we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of all the contemporary cultures and all of the industrial age cultures and the TV cultures are going to toss it out the window with the exception of anime, because that's Chan culture. <laughs> um, uh, they formed a metaculture about themselves. It's almost as if they removed all the cultures just to build their own. That was interesting. They formed groups of people where honest communication was valued and hated simultaneously. And what would end up happening, you would see these, even in that space where it's just, what looks like complete noise to the average person, and it looks like just a, a, a waterfall of hate. But if you really dig into it, you will see people communicating with each other in the most genuine manner possible because they recognize this is truthful. You, you can't get that on social media where there's identity because there's always a secondary game going on. Mm. There's always the, the game of, of signaling or posturing mm -hmm. or whatever, the peacocking of things. Mm -hmm. Chans, you don't get that. If I'm connecting with a person on the chans, it's because we both recognize the rules of the game and, oh shit, you said something that actually moved me and I'm, I'm now compelled to actually do something with this information. The only thing you can do on a social media platform is share. Share, that's, that's, your, that's, your, it's, that's your interaction. It's, oh, you have your like, People throw likes like it's cheap currency. People share like it's expensive currency. So you can either spend your crap cash or you can spend your gold. And, they, and it's, it's almost like Gresham's Laws in effect. People throw the crap social interactions around all day, but the share is the one they really hoard and they only share that because it's reflective of their reputation on the social networks. Meanwhile, on the chance if something actually moves you, you are compelled mind, body, and spirit to continuously act on that sort of, uh, that experience that you went through. It's a spiritual movement. It's a transition entirely. It's outside of sh sharing is the least thing you do. You're transforming yourself to now align yourself with that honest truth that was there. It doesn't happen often. I'm not, I'm not telling you you're going to find you know, Buddha on the way to the shitpost. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does happen. Mm. And I started chronicling those events and looking at where they were binding and how they were interacting. And I saw 
a common thread. I saw this general disillusionment with the way things are. I mean, it's pretty, it's obvious, but they were, they were different than the way they were looking at it. They wanted to do something about it. It wasn't throw my hands up as nihilism, let me do drugs until I die sort of thing. It was, this is fucked up and I want to do something about it and I'm anonymous and I can do something about it and it won't get back to me. So the social punishment was entirely gone. They were free to act and they were free to do things in which the traditional means of keeping them in check were completely gone. Mm. This was all I needed. <laughs> this was all I needed mm -hmm. because this was, this was a, an army waiting to be organized. And so I started looking at the primary people who were trying to stop them. And I didn't get an answer at first. There's too many, you, you start talking that game, you start talking conspiracy theory. And that's not helping anybody because you have to, you have, if you want a meaningful target, you got to hit something that really, really resonates. Um, and so for a long time, I didn't have a target. But I, st I, kept, I kept interacting. Then Gamergate happened. And oh my God. Oh. <laughs> You could probably have me back just to talk Gamergate because there was so much. Just, for those who don't know, Gamergate was this weird cultural explosion where. Oh, God, there's so much. There's so much. I don't even know how to make it concise. It was. I think 20,000 members of 4chan got banned because they went after some terrible game but the game was made by a female, and so it turned into this big battle of the sexes sort of thing, and it just exploded out of control. It's a mess, absolute mess. There was, there was no rhyme or reason or sense to any of it. Um, but no one had ever seen channers get banned like that. That doesn't happen. That's a board where a terrible place, anything happens there. You don't get banned. You have to go out of your way to get banned from 4chan, but these guys got banned in mass, and that tells us, those who are familiar with the chans, that this was an inside job. This was the mods being compromised. They were intentionally targeting these people and just smacking them and getting rid of them. That was bad. And this took all these, all these other people who were, who were on the chains but kind of fell out, but it brought them all back. And now there was this standing army who were ready to really attack this problem at hand because it went after the one point in their lives that was actually constant, that where you had these emotional connections and you had this serial spiritual transformations going down. The temple was now uh, uh, desecrated effectively. And it brought them back to movement and they turned into a massive, massive force that bordered on the line of political. Uh, we saw this with the advent of, of uh, when, when Milo Yiannopoulos comes down to defend Gamergate, when even the, the likes of Mike Cernovich come down to defend Gamergate early on. Uh, th these were people who had transformed a lot of the talking points that were being thrown by the supporters, which I didn't get into and I should have. When this, sorry, I got a back step, I got a backtrack of it. When the, when the people got banned, there were these 10 news outlets who came out with this coordinated hit that said gamers were racist and gamers were the most terrible things in history and kill all gamers and fuck them and this, that, and the other. It was this coordinated media hit against them, uh, which of course attracted the opposite, to come and support the gamers. Um, the, research this on your own where you can. It's, it's, it's tough to research because a, a lot of the material has been manufactured to make gamers look more demonic than they actually are. Um, they're not saints, they're assholes, but they're not demonic. Um, this was the sandbox in which all of these things were possible, all the things I'm talking about, because now you have this high explosion, uh, this high emotional content going on in these contexts where you can, uh, you can try an idea and it gets rapidly consumed and rapidly evaded and, and it evolves. It's, 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 it's this evolution chamber of emotional, symbological uh, 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 steering trying to build an army. That's what I was trying to do. Build an army that can actually have an impact in the real world. And it came to a head with the advent of the Butterfly War. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's a lot. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> that is a lot. And we have um, the graphic now that we can bring up on for the Butterfly War. <clears throat> and so now we have this this these the the humans in Shan that have been treating this as a sacred space to be able to galvanize them. Yeah. 
Okay, and yeah. then use that for attacking artificial intelligence. Right, and okay. so um, I had realized very early on that the only way to go after the chans was to use AI to do it. You can't use social punishment. You can't shame them. It's all anonymous. So now you have to use statistical analysis of their metadata and their behavior to try and suppress them. So they were ground zero for the censorship stuff that's starting to take place now. And I saw that very early on. And I said, no, we're going to do, we're going to have to have a heart of AI on this one. Because uh, if you went after the political players, they just swap them out. Mm. I was like, oh, this figurehead's down, bring in a new one. That wasn't going to stop them down or slow them about up. The AI weakness was so ripe and so misunderstood that it was a perfect target. Um, and so what I did was I started channeling what I had known about the evolution of neurology to figure out the mismatches between what AI is doing and what humans are doing. And I found that AI was making a lot of mistakes that usually get smoothed over because of scale. So for example, if you're asked to lay concrete on a street, um, as long as you get 90% of it, who cares if 10% of it's cracked? You kind of finish the job, um, so you're good enough. That's how AI sort of approaches it when you take an AI approach to censorship. We've banned a good chunk of the bad behavior, but the outliers also got hit by the stuff, and that's dismissible because we own a large amount of the ability to tell people why what we did was good. Uh, they, uh, Silicon Valley has the ability to own the narrative as well as own the, the, the censorship tech simultaneously, so it's a very interesting duality. Um, but there are certain people under American law that you absolutely positively cannot target. They are called protected classes. Okay. So you have a redlining was this concept in the 70s and 80s where banks would not loan would not give loans to African Americans because they didn't have the collateral arrangements or they had a history of poor payment or the perception that they had a history of poor payment. So this is called, they would draw red lines around the maps of districts where they wouldn't issue loans. This was considered unconstitutional across the board by the 70s and 80s. So this was a huge violation. The banks had to re restructure their entire practices around this. Um, and it wasn't even as if that particular population was driving a huge part of of loan demand. Most of the loan demand was coming from business and, and middle class whites at that time. Um, it was as if they were trying to protect their portfolio from potential risk um, or the illusion of risk or whatever the case may be. And that was sort of their justification. But that all changed under law. They changed that entirely. But that opened up something called disparate impact. Disparate impact is a fascinating piece of legalism where the courts basically throw their hands up and they say, well, we can't define what racism is, but if you can convince us that something is racist, we'll believe you. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. It's almost a sort of like democratically determine what's racist. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we'll come down and say you, this violates civil rights law or whatever the case may be. Is um, that what's kind of happening with the censorship right now? That's what I'm trying to make happen. So the thing is that you can't necessarily make AI target something it doesn't want to target when you have let's say the Googles and the, and the Twitters of the world let's say they have a staff of really zealous true believers who really want to double down and eliminate all these people who deplatform all of these people who, 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 who don't deserve a voice um, and they have beautiful justification for it I mean it's real sexy slick stuff they're throwing out there uh, very believable stuff, especially for people who aren't in the trenches of it. I mean, you, you'd look at the board and be like, yeah, screw those guys, deplatform them. Very sexy stuff. You won't be able to convince them to go after these high threat targets uh, and high threat in the terms of targeting protected classes, uh, 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 trying to make AI methodologies say we're going to target people who are African-American, we're going to target people who are Muslim, we're going to target people who are female, this, that, and the other. That's a no-go from the jump. No one's that dumb that you can convince someone to do that, but there is a way to make them do that. So this is where Butterfly War comes in. When Charles Darwin first started evolution, uh, his theory of evolution, uh, he, he described a great number of animals, 
uh, and their evolutionary behavior and patterns. But the butterfly was a perplexing creature. He couldn't quite explain why the wing evolved the way it did. It didn't make sense. Um, the last thing you wanted to do was have this attractive wing because clearly you get picked out of a forest with yellow wings <laughs> as a predator. That's giving them free food effectively. So why would these things evolve with bright colors that would attract predators and guarantee their deaths? It didn't make sense um, until this guy named Franz Mueller came along, naturalist in the 1800s. He said, ah, well, what if the butterflies taste bad? Hmm. He's like, now wait a minute, what if they taste, oh, okay. So what this means is, if I eat a butterfly and it tastes bad, the predator will avoid it. Mm -hmm. It will also avoid anything that looks like it. Mm -hmm. So what this means is the butterflies will start to adopt looking like bad tasting food. Mm -hmm. Interesting idea, it gets worse. It turns out this bad tasting strategy will jump species. Other species will embrace the colors of bad tasting, the colors and patterns of bad tasting food. Mm -hmm. and, th and they gain of equal, equal protection from the predator. Now, when you take this entire interplay and overlay it across civil rights, the exact same thing happens where... So if we're seeing the way that people are being censored and then we uh, act as bad tasting food to not get censored? Yes, that's right. So in this case, the bad tasting food is going after the protected classes. Because if you do that, the federal government will come down on you heavy-handed. And just to give you an example, uh, the Little Rock Nine, I think that's the number, when civil rights was first rolled out in the, in the school system in the South in Arkansas, uh, Eisenhower deployed the freaking military to escort those, those children to school. So the executive has already established a precedent to say, we will deploy the military to protect civil rights. So that's all there. That's from the jump. So that's, that is a be careful against attacking these groups of people, it will taste bad. So all you have to do is make your devices generate the metadata of that group that tastes bad. And now you can't tell them apart. There's nothing you can do. So now your policy, your censorship policy, will turn around and say, well, these white nationalists are pretending to be pretending to be blacks to, to do all these things and we have to now stop them. And now what you're doing is you're coming up with this ridiculous policy where you're now saying, well, these behaviors are what real African-Americans do. These behaviors are not what they do. So now you're coming up with this phrenological concept where you're trying to classify these protected classes into what acceptable behavior they mm -hmm, can do mm -hmm. versus what they're not allowed to do. It becomes messy really quick and you're gonna start accumulating a tremendous amount of collateral damage as a result of your censorship policies. And you can automate the production Creation. of these memes and then all of a sudden you have billions of these bot farm memes that are spreading and then it gets really messy when oh, there's yeah. like, oh, we need to hit this, we need to turn that one off, we need to turn this one off, to censor that, censor this, censor that. And it's like, that, those aren't even real accounts over there, accounts. oh my God. And then it, yeah. It's messy. And so, so that, that creates a free speech environment then? Uh, it creates, it, it, create? it, it eventually results <clears throat> in a detente where the f Silicon Valley will have accumulated a significant amount of collateral damage, which will result in lawsuits. Uh, you will see this with Candace Owens, by the way. Her, what she's doing will result in one of these with lawsuits. With Candace Owens? Yeah, yeah. That will okay. happen. And um, it's already happening with starting, James Damore and the James Damore and all that sort of thing. Yeah. That's right. That's starting to play out. Um, she's going to lead the spear on that, uh, and there will be a lot more follow-up. The, the, there will be a redlining event in Silicon Valley. It will happen. Um, we're doing what we can to make sure it happens. But the... the uh, that Silicon Valley gets called out. Called out on it. Yeah. Because they're already doing it. They're just not getting caught doing it. They're already creating cyber phrenological profiles of minorities to market to them. When's the last time you saw an ad for like, I don't know, Popeye's chicken or something like that? Nothing. Probably didn't see that. No. I don't see it. No one's seen it. Certain groups see that. When's the last time uh, an African American making $20,000 a year saw uh, an ad for golf clubs? Right? It's not a thing. So they're already building these profiles of what is and what isn't acceptable African American behavior, what is and isn't acceptable female behavior. They're already violating civil rights. They're just not getting called out on it. They're not getting caught doing it. 
So if, I, if, I, <clears throat> if, I, if I'm a woman and I'm a certain um, age group and a certain uh, city location, a certain income level, I'm going to be targeted in a specific way because I have a, built a psychometric profile That's right. and I'm being sold shit that I don't even need or want, That's right. these types of things. And so to be called out on that and to say that, <clears throat> hey, how do we have a global conversation about your role as the, uh, as the store of all of the knowledge of civilization? For us to query, how do we either figure out how to decentralize you, make it so that all of civilization can partake in a that's way right. that's fair and just and that's right. has great peace and dignity involved in it and yeah. not that's controlled by a handful of people. Yeah, it's heavily centralized and that's one of their downsides. The more centralized they remain, the more prone to butterfly war they become. They have to split up in order to survive and endure. They have to allow different perspectives to exist. So, so decentralization uh, prevents butterfly war. Yes, that's correct. Because then everyone has a perspective. At that point, you're not collecting. You will still be collecting metadata on individuals and their psychodemographics, I suppose that's the word for it. Um, but the control over who can speak and who cannot speak and who can influence and who cannot influence, that gets destroyed. Yeah. Yep, which is already getting to become quite intense yes. even right now. Um, all right, wrapping, wrapping thoughts. Do we covered, I think we covered things quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so then with the decentralization, we feel like we can tackle the, the AI arms race, the multi-AI arms race. Yeah, let me get some water for this one. Yeah. So... Butterfly War is an example of what I'm calling Gnostic Warfare. When you're trying to trick an AI, and in the case of Butterfly War, what you're doing is you're sending, meta, let me explain the, the mechanism in full. Um, the, what you're doing is you're sending metadata of your device up to Google until they show you the ad of whatever protected class you want to see. So I will send my accelerometer data, my swipe data, not my text, not my sentiment, not my stuff like that, but all the other auxiliary stuff that's more trusted because it's assumed that people can't hack that sort of thing. You send that up until you get the ads you want and then you know that you've convinced Google or Twitter that you, they think you're an actual protected class now. Okay. And they have to do that because that's how advertising works. Mm. They have to show you the ads. So they're screwed. They, they've opened up their adaptation loop, their OTA loop, so you can totally exploit yeah. that. Um, this is an example of hacking an AI. No matter what, it's, it's a full hack of an AI. It's not just hacking the, um, the training uh, cycling, or the, the, the training period, or, or hacking the, um, the fine tuning. In this case, we're hacking the secondary policies, and we're going after the culture that those training and retrainings allow. Uh, it's a complete and total multi-step hack that even if you fix one part, you couldn't fix the other part. And in the, in the process of fixing one part, you're actually exposing that you're violating civil rights the, along the way. So this is an example of Gnostic warfare where you're, it is a total engagement of every part of the AI infrastructure, not just the tech side of it. Yeah. There's, plenty of, uh, there's plenty of situations where, uh, let me back up, let me wind that one back a bit. Which maybe we can also do in the second conversation. Yeah, in the second conversation. Um, Let's let's save let's save a lot of what we're about to hit on the yeah. second conversation. There's this is I think this was would you agree it's pretty decent on the first on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, it cool. should it should raise enough questions. Uh, I think so too. It, uh, just to recap, Elon Musk is running around talking about Eli, uh, talking about a, uh, AI that's going to be terrible to beat, and I'm here giving manuals on how to beat AI. So hmm. hopefully people will find that useful. Yeah, interesting. Super countercultural. I love it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. very love much. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Super open-minded to yeah to what this is. Yeah. Um, are we in a simulation? There's one test I've seen that can confirm that. It's using X-ray uh, gamma rays. What you do is uh, the way gamma rays move through space. Um, they are considered maximum density energy. Uh, and the way they move through space can betray the metadata of why they move through space. 
and that's being used as a metric to answer that question. So I'm holding out to see the result of that one. Interesting, I don't think anyone's uh, answered that with uh, actually, uh, we, we talk about being able to poke at the simulation with the scientific probe and right. gamma rays may be a that's way the, to do so. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. okay. And then uh, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Beauty, aesthetics, beauty. Beauty. The most beautiful thing in the universe is a mind unburdened by its own context. Unburdened by its own context. Yeah. Free. As free as you can get it. As free as you can get it. This has been awesome, Patrick. <laughs> I've had such a blast hosting yeah. you. It's been good, man. Thank you so much for yeah. coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Huge it. Huge pleasure. Huge yeah. pleasure. Yeah, there's been so much good stuff to unpack. Really excited for round two. We'll make that happen. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Go and start talking more about Gnostic Warfare. Go and start talking more about how to attack or hack AI, about ways to spread memes through things like metadata, butterfly wars, these types of things, the, ev the evolution of neurons, evolution of us. Talk to our friends, families, coworkers, people online on social media about these things. Let's get talking more and building more about it. Huge shout out to Ron Vagas for producing and directing. Ooh. Thank you very much, Ron. Check out the links in the bio to cultstate.com as well as Patrick's Twitter. Check those out. And also support the artist entrepreneurs, the communities around the world that you believe in. Support them, help them grow, support simulation. Our links are below to our Patreon or PayPal or cryptocurrency links. Also, if you want to design merch, get paid, and spread thought-provoking questions, our UB link is below as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon. Peace.